Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Matt Shepard and I'll be your moderator for today's Team Gleason Center for Medicare Advocacy webinar, an overview of Medicare for people living with ALS. Uh, a little bit about the center and Team Gleason. The Center for Medicare Advocacy, as some of our audience probably know, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization which, since its founding in 1986, has worked to obtain fair access to Medicare and quality health care for older people and people with disabilities through education, training, analytical research, advocacy, and legal assistance. The center is staffed by attorneys, advocates, nurses, and technical experts, all working for systemic change based on our daily experiences with the problems of real Medicare beneficiaries. Team Gleason's mission is to help provide individuals with neuromuscular diseases or injuries with leading edge technology, equipment, and services to create a global conversation about ALS to ultimately find solutions and an end to the disease and to raise public awareness toward ALS by providing and documenting extraordinary life adventures for individuals with muscular diseases or injuries. This webinar is brought to you as part of the Team Gleason Center for Medicare Advocacy, Medicare and Home Health Initiative to help people living with ALS understand Medicare, including the home health benefit, and to maximize access to coverage and care. The initiative includes this webinar, as well as one focusing on home health care next week, Wednesday the 18th, and one examining case studies on May 9th. The initiative also includes a dedicated email portal for those living with ALS to ask questions and share home health access stories. Share yours at homehealth at medicareadvocacy.org. In addition, center attorneys will host several virtual town hall calls every second Wednesday at three through June, July, and August for people living with ALS, where we can discuss those answers and stories and take live questions. Today's webinar will be presented by Center Executive Director Judith Stein and Associate Director Kathleen Holt. Before I let them start though, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you can hear me, you use the information in the email you received after registration to successfully log into the webinar, and you've dialed in by phone or have good quality working speakers on your computer, either of which is great. If you have used the telephone call in, we will also be able to hear you when we open up for questions. Uh, we planned a lot of time for questions today, so I hope we get plenty of people who are brave and bold and want to talk. Uh, otherwise, I hope you are absolutely sure that your computer has a good quality mic. If you aren't, it's never too late to dial in using the instructions provided on the confirmation email or under the audio tab on the control panel that's at the right of your screen. Uh, if, as sometimes happens with us, you have dialed into the audio portion without actually logging into the online, you can hear us, but you won't see that control panel or the presentation. Uh, you do need to log in for us to interact. Let's discuss that control panel that I mentioned. There are a couple key features for our purposes today. The buttons on the tab on the left side of the panel, a little orange arrow that lets you hide the panel so it's not in your way a little square that'll let you watch the presentation in full screen view. And then there's a little picture of a hand. That's important, that's used to indicate that you have a question. For the bulk of the presentation, we're going to keep our attendees muted. But when we open it up for questions at the end, please use that icon to indicate that you wish to speak and I'll unmute you. And don't worry if we don't get to your questions live or you're shy and decide you don't wanna ask it aloud, uh, you can type questions into the questions pane of the control panel, or you can email them to us uh, during the presentation or after the fact at that homehealth at medicareadvocacy.org email address. Uh, please note that this presentation will be recorded for future viewing. So if you don't want to be heard or have your inquiry read live, uh, please do use that email address. Uh, you can get it to us after the fact. And finally, while everyone should have received a copy of the slides for today's presentation at the email address they used to register, if for some reason they didn't make it, please email me directly at mshepard at medicareadvocacy.org. That's M-S-H-E-P-A-R-D, and I will get you a copy personally. Thank you all for attending today, and I'll now hand things over to Associate Director Kathy Holt. Kathy? Thanks, Matt, and good afternoon, everyone. I've been an active ALS advocate for over 25 years. I've shared this journey with a number of you who know you've been my inspiration. So it's an honor to join in community with all of you today. I'm also privileged to be a Team Gleason board member and a big fan of both Steve Gleason and the fabulous team 
that makes up Team Gleason. Living with ALS brings so many challenges and we know that Medicare coverage is just a small part of everything you're faced with. But we hope that we can share information and provide you with resources like the materials we've put together for this webinar that can help you make a few of those challenges a little bit easier. So let's look at what we're going to go through today. And again, we realize that um, different people are at different places. Some of you already have Medicare. Some of you are um, anticipating getting Medicare. And what we'll go through today are the general tenets of the Medicare process, the enrollment, the coverage, and the costs. But most essentially, what this is, is a materials for you to have as reference and to give you more information about how do you maximize um, your own journey, if you will, with Medicare. So we'll look at three, I'm um, sorry, three, um, seven mm -hmm. distinct parts of the, um, of, of the overview of Medicare today. So part one, when individuals with ALS can get Medicare. Part two, the Medicare enrollment process. Um, then next, an overview of Medicare coverage. Then we'll turn to look at what are the out-of-pocket costs in Medicare and what are some of the assistance to help with out-of-pocket costs. Then we'll look at the coordination of Medicare with other insurance. And finally, in part seven, Judy will um, hold a discussion about choosing between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage and give you some ideas about how you make that very important choice for yourself. Um, and following that, we will, um, as Matt mentioned, have discussion and questions and, uh, and see what we can do to help individuals. So part one, when an individual with ALS can get Medicare. So when an individual has been determined under the Social Security or Railroad Retirement Act, to meet the criteria for the program of Social Security Disability Insurance or Railroad Disability Insurance based on their own work record, and the individual has fulfilled a five-month waiting period, not including a partial month, beginning from the Social Security determined onset date of the disability, also known as when the individual is no longer performing substantial gainful work activity. So let's look at an example of when an individual with ALS can get Medicare. Mr. Hall applies for SSDI and Social Security determines the onset date of his disability, the date he was no longer performing substantial work activities to be June 10th of 2017. So Mr. Hall's waiting period for Social Security and Medicare benefits is five months after the first of the month in which the Social Security determined his onset date. So again, we don't count June because it's a partial month. So July, August, September, October, November would be the five month waiting period. So his entitlement to Social Security and Medicare would be effective as of December 1st of 2017. There are other individuals with ALS who may be eligible for Medicare although they're not insured for Social Security. Some public employees, such as teachers, um, firefighters, policemen, only pay Medicare taxes and not Social Security. So once an individual has earned 40 quarters of Medicare coverage, and in 2018, a quarter of, of coverage is essentially, there are four quarters in the year, so in three months time, an individual, once an individual has made $1,320, they have earned a quarter or a credit. Then he or she is eligible for Medicare Part A once they've earned 40 Medicare quarters of coverage without paying a premium and can also elect Part B coverage. So I would also caution you, um, in, if you're in this situation of not having paid into Social Security but having paid into Medicare, that there is um, the 2040 quarter rule applies to qualify. And what is that? So the 2040 rule means, uh, again, looking at 20 quarters, which is the equivalent of five years, four quarters times five is 20, um, out five years out of 10 years, the individual would have had to pay Medicare into the program before they start to use it. 
Some other individuals with ALS who may be eligible for Medicare include disabled widow and widowers. And so at age 50, if an, if an individual who doesn't qualify on their own work record, but they are a disabled widow or widower, they can qualify on a deceased spouse's work record. And at age 60, for an individual who doesn't qualify on her, his or her own record, but qualifies again on the Medicare record of a deceased spouse, again, such as a teacher, a public employee. And that would be a qualification for Medicare only and not Social Security. So now let's look at the Medicare enrollment process. An individual with ALS who's preparing to get Social Security disability insurance or railroad benefit will be contacted by Social Security about Medicare enrollment. An individual with ALS will be automatically enrolled in both Medicare Parts A and B, but has the option of turning down Part B if there's other coverage um, since Part B requires a premium. So let's again look at enrollment for individuals who decline Part B. The failure to enroll timely may result in a Part B late enrollment penalty, which is 10% for every 12 months not enrolled. The general enrollment period would be for someone who did not enroll timely. A general enrollment period is available for the first three months of the year, but unfortunately, if you're late in enrolling and you have to enroll through the general enrollment period rather than the initial enrollment period or a special enrollment period, your coverage would not begin until July 1st. And the individual may be subject to an enrollment penalty if you don't enroll timely. So these are just considerations to keep in the back of your mind as you're getting, if you're getting ready to um, apply for Medicare that you wanna make sure that you are aware of the penalties that are in, in, involved if you don't um, enroll in a timely manner. So now let's turn to what Medicare coverage involves. So just as a big 30,000 foot overview of Medicare, there are typically known as four parts to Medicare. There's the Part A, which is considered hospital insurance or called hospital insurance. And then there's medical insurance under Part B. Part A and Part B together are known as traditional or original Medicare. Oftentimes when people have Part A and Part B, they also obtain supplemental policies such as a Medigap policy or a Medicare um, a special needs plan or a Medicare um, enrollment plan. Uh, in addition, there are retirement plans that people have available for supplemental policies. So um, look around for what supplemental policies are available to you. In addition, there is uh, the, the um, people usually get a drug plan, a prescription drug plan, either through the VA, through Part D Medicare or retirement. So in addition to traditional or original Medicare, there's Part C Medicare, which is also known as the Medicare Advantage Program or Managed Care Medicare. In Managed Care Medicare, there are uh, plans that have both prescription drug coverage and plans that are standalone Medicare Advantage plans that do not have prescription drug coverage. And those may be helpful to someone who has prescription drugs uh, covered through another uh, another means. Um, and then Part D Medicare, as I mentioned, is the prescription drug benefit. So that's the big overview when you hear people talk about Part A and Part B Medicare, traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage, which is a separate way of getting benefits, or Part C Medicare, and then the prescription drug benefit, which is also known as Part D. So traditional Medicare Part A, as I mentioned, it covers inpatient hospital care, but it also covers skilled nursing facility care, home health care, and hospice care. Part B covers physician services, home health care, and as you can see, as I mentioned, home health care can be covered under Part A or Part B. I would note that it's the same exact benefit coverage whether it's a paid for under Part A or Part B, 
it's the same exact coverage. Uh, there, and there are reasons, mostly because some people only have Part A Medicare, some people have Part B. Um, and so there, there's a historical reason for it, but the long and the short of it is, uh, we'll talk a little bit more later uh, and quite a bit in the next two webinars that we'll have on home healthcare specifically. But just know that it could be paid for under Part A or Part B. Outpatient services and therapy are covered under Part B durable medical equipment, prosthetics and orthotics, ambulance services, and certain preventive services. So you'll note, um, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the payment for Medicare, but specifically note that physician services, outpatient therapy, durable medical equipment, prosthetics, and orthotics um, typically have a 20% co-payment with those. And then there's Part C Medicare, Medicare Advantage. So those are the private insurance plans that contract with Medicare to provide coverage. Medicare Advantage plans combine Part A and Part B. In terms, of when I say they combine, they combine the coverage that's offered under Medicare Parts A and Part B. And sometimes they cover prescription drugs. Medicare Advantage plans often have limited provider networks. Medicare Advantage plans must provide at least as much coverage as traditional Medicare does. So again, it's important to know that no matter um, which, which, you, which road you decide to choose, and again, Judy will go through um, how do you make a choice between traditional Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan, the coverage that happens under a Medicare Advantage plan must be at least as much as is provided under traditional Medicare. Remember that Medicare Advantage plans are not supplemental insurance. They are not in addition to or on top of traditional Medicare. They are a choice that's instead of choosing traditional Medicare. And also Medigap policies, and I'll talk a little bit more about these in the payment, but Medigap policies typically um, are uh, additional policies that people get to help them with um, deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance. They are not allowed with Medicare Advantage plans. Therefore, deductibles, co-payments, or co-insurance are generally paid out of pocket or included as an extra benefit by the Medicare Advantage plan, but very rarely. So now let's look at the out-of-pocket costs in Medicare. First of all, the premiums, Part A premiums. Uh, so if, there, if you have the 40 or more quarters of coverage, then Medicare is, I hate to say free, um, Medicare Part A is not free because you've paid into this system. Um, you have uh, paid your premiums um, over the years. And so while it is essentially no continued payment, um, it, it's not fair to say that it's a, a free benefit. Uh, but if you paid essentially over your lifetime, 40 or more coverage, 40 or more quarters of coverage or 10 years into the Social Security and Medicare system, or the Medicare system, excuse me, then um, your premium is free. Now, for those people who um, are, are a few quarters short uh, between 30 and 39 quarters of coverage, uh, in order to get Part A, they need to pay $232 a month. And again, um, you can see that these slides are really meant to, to be a guidance um, and to give you information. Uh, there's certainly um, no need for you to retain this information other than to know that it's here. And Part B premiums, I would say the same thing. Um, generally, for people who have uh, income less than $85,000 a year, and that income is determined through the IRS as people file their tax returns, the adjusted gross income um, is determined. For those who have less than $85,000 a year, the Medicare premium is $134 a month. And then you can see as the income categories rise, that the premiums for Medicare Part B um, also increase. Now, I will say all this, this is, a lot of this is so confusing, isn't it? So one of the things that to remember is whether or not you choose to eventually get your coverage through a Medicare Advantage plan 
or traditional Medicare, everyone in Medicare is responsible for paying the Part B premium. Um, Medicare will then provide uh, money to the, Medic the private Medicare Advantage plans, um, and they may have an additional premium. But you can't get a Medicare Advantage plan unless you have paid um, your Part B premiums. So Medicare deductibles for 2018, uh, in a hospital, it's $1,340. You will notice it's not per year, it's per what is known as a benefit period. So for instance, if you go into the hospital in January um, and then you, you satisfy your deductible and you're out of the hospital for more than 60 days, and when I say out of the hospital, that means out of a, out of a facility for more than 60 days. Um, if you go home, for instance, and then have to be rehospitalized later in the year, you would have to pay that hospital deductible again. Um, so it's not an annual deductible, it's a, what's known as a benefit period deductible. Um, and the Part B deductible, which is per year, is $183. Uh, Copays and coinsurance, again, in 2018, uh, you can see the hospital uh, coinsurance amounts, there's no coinsurance for days one through 60, just that deductible that I just showed you. Um, for days 61 through 90, it's $335 a day. And then if you're in the hospital more than 90 days, um, then it jumps up to $670 a day. So Medicare has what's known as a one-time lifetime reserve day, which are the days 91 through 150 in the hospital. You get those one time. Other than that, um, the hospital stays are limited to 90 days. Uh, in the skilled nursing facility, there are no, there's no coinsurance. On, and again, I have to stop myself and remind everyone that I'm talking about traditional Medicare here because Medicare Advantage plans all have their own different deductibles and coinsurance. But in traditional Medicare, these are the numbers that we're talking about. So day one through 20, there is no coinsurance in a skilled nursing facility. Uh, and then following that, uh, days 21 to 100, that's the coverage limit, is 100 days in a skilled nursing facility is up to 167.50. And then again, for Part B, um, the coinsurance for those services that I mentioned, the doctors, uh, the durable medical equipment, prosthetics, orthotics and supplies, and outpatient therapy is typically 20%. Other costs to consider in Medicare, again, if you're choosing traditional Medicare, think about what the Medigap premiums are. Medigap insurance plans are supplemental plans that help pay deductibles and coinsurance. They are not Medicare coverage, in any sense of the word, Medicare would typically pay for the coverage, determine reasonable and necessary, and then once that happens and you are um, registered with Medicare to have a Medigap plan, um, Medicare will automatically send the, um, the payment notification to the Medigap plan and the Medigap plan will take care of paying the coinsurance and deductibles. Um, the other thing, Excuse me, most people um, obtain a Part D prescription drug plan, and any premiums or coinsurance that would be required under those would be, um, that would be in addition to what you've paid for the Medigap premium and also the Medicare, excuse me, Part B um, uh, premium. If you choose instead of traditional Medicare to um, opt for a Medicare Advantage plan, and then additional coinsurance and copays are um, dependent on the particular plan that you choose. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, now let's look at the assistance that's available to help with all of these out potential out-of-pocket costs in Medicare. So there's something known as the Medicare Savings Program. Um, and these are available to individuals uh, across uh, the country. Medicare savings programs provide assistance with meeting some or all of the costs of Medicare premiums, deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance. So essentially, um, depending on what you qualify for, you can get all of your out-of-pocket costs covered by, uh, by these Medicare savings programs. 
They are based on federal poverty, le poverty levels. Um, and states, territories, and Washington, D.C. may alter Medicare savings program requirements. And for example, Connecticut eliminated the resource or asset taste test. Um, Washington, D.C. raised the income eligibility uh, on one of their programs from 100% to 300%. But the vast majority of states do use the federal guidelines. And I would note that states with revised guidelines that I would um, say to those of you who are living in these states to please um, contact, we'll give you some contact information of how to find out how different these resource guidelines are for you. But Alaska, Connecticut, Washington, DC, Hawaii, Maine, Minnesota, and Virginia. So that, uh, with, under the Medicare savings programs, I'm gonna talk about um, the three programs that are um, really the, the most used by individuals. So Qualified Medicare Beneficiary Program, also known as the QMB, the Specified Low Income Medicare Beneficiary Program, and the Qualified Individual Program. Then we'll also look at some low income subsidies. And there's a, um, a resource here for you to be able to, to um, look at how these programs would help, help you. So the first one is the Medicare Benefit, Medicare Qualified Medicare Beneficiary Program. Uh, with income of up to 100% of the federal poverty level. This program pays all the cost sharing for Medicare. So premiums, deductibles, co-insurance, and co-payments. The monthly income limits for QMB, the Qualified Medicare Beneficiary Program, for an individual are $1,032 in 2018 and $1,392 if you're married. Um, and again, I would note that these uh, monthly income limits are subject to change and not just on an annual basis. So um, if you're close to meeting some of these limits, keep an eye on them because they do, um, they do change from time to time. Uh, for the QMB, the resource limits are uh, $7,560 for an individual and $11,340 if you're married. The, the other thing that I would say about the resource limits is they're typically talking about cash resources. So if individuals have a home, they have a car, um, they have furniture, other assets, those are not typically included in the resource limits um, that are mentioned here. So um, there's a, the next level, if you will, of um, Medicare beneficiary program qualification is the specified low income. And that income is between 100% and 120% of federal poverty level. That helps to pay uh, for Part B premiums if an individual is eligible for Part B. And again, um, I'm not gonna read out the monthly income limits and the resource limits, but you can use this as a guide to see if you might qualify um, for help with the Part B premiums. Another uh, additional help for Medicare Savings Program uh, is between 120 and 135 percent of the federal poverty level. It also helps for Part B premiums. Um, so it's important that in this case, um, individuals apply annually, and um, and determination of uh, eligibility is uh, is made. And then there's a low income subsidy that helps to cover all or most of the Part B, Part D, excuse me, medication premium and the coinsurance and copayments. So those um, who have Medicaid are automatically eligible or if you have access to a Medicare savings program. And also they are available for individuals on a sliding scale uh, with income, as you can see there, that is um, higher than the other programs that I mentioned, and also resource limits that are higher. Other payment assistant resources are um, buy-ins that are available. So it varies by state, but again, if individuals can't afford Part A and Part B premiums, um, they should check by, into their state to see if they if the state will help them to uh, achieve a buy-in. 
And also the best resource that I can tell you, uh, we have such respect for the state health insurance programs, also known as the SHIPS. Um, and if you go to this particular website, the, she, the SHIP uh, Technical Assistance Center or shiptacenter.org, uh, they will put you in touch with the state in which you live in, and you can contact an individual counselor uh, who will help you to determine exactly what kind of payment assistance you might qualify for. And different states have different assistance too. So the ones that I shared with you were the federal programs that are available in every state, but every state also has other programs. So um, I'd encourage you to look into that. So now we're going to look at coordination of Medicare with other insurance. So we want to ensure that the proper payment order happens for individuals. There's nothing more frustrating than to think that some um, <coughs> coverage is going to be made when it really should be coverage that's done by another um, insurer. So the, the best, these are the best steps that I could give you on that. So an individual should provide all types of coverage information on his or her initial enrollment questionnaire when they're signing up for Medicare. And if your health coverage changes thereafter, the individual should tell Medicare, and not just Medicare, but all of your providers, because it's important um, that everybody knows, um, and everybody's on the same page as to who, who gets billed and when they get billed. And you can confirm this information that you've provided to Medicare with the Benefits Coordination and Recovery Center. And let me tell you, this is all these folks do is make sure that the coordination of uh, different kinds of insurance are all made together. So there's a telephone number for you there, um, and, and it's a lot of um, effort well put in to get this taken care of um, up front and as quickly as possible. Uh, I will say that um, even if people get payment out of order, uh, that Medicare may make a conditional payment even when they aren't supposed to pay first. And that sometimes will happen, for instance, if um, if someone has an insurance that, that's not paying um, in a timely manner and the, the uh, provider's office is getting irritated, um, Medicare may pay and then pick uh, go after the insurance company. Um, we've helped some people in this regard, so it can be done. So here are the general rules about who pays first for individuals with, um, with ALS who have uh, other types of coverage in addition to Medicare. If, if an individual is entitled to Medicare and Medicaid, Medicare is the payer of, as we call it, the payer of first resort in this case, and Medicaid pays last. If an individual is under age 65 and is covered by a large group health plan, and uh, again, under 65, it's 100 or more employees based on coverage of a family member, um, then that large group health plan will pay first and Medicare should pay second. Uh, under age 65 and covered by a group health plan with less than 100 employees, then Medicare will pay first and the group health plan second. And if an individual who has ALS is over age 65 and is again covered um, secondarily by a group health plan, as long as that group health plan has 20 or more employees, the group health plan will pay first and Medicare will pay second. Um, then there are other types of insurance such as COBRA, uh, veterans and TRICARE. Um, if you're disabled and you're covered by COBRA, Medicare pays first and COBRA pays second. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more at, about COBRA in a second because I think it's really critical that people um, don't make a mistake with COBRA. Um, if you're a veteran with veterans benefits, then the VA will pay uh, authorized coverage um, uh, or Medicare coverage, so, or there will be Medicare coverage, excuse me, uh, for care in the community. Uh, there's a coordination of how that works. If you're getting care through the VA, then the VA will pay. If you're getting care in the community, Medicare will cover, uh, but neither pays twice. So um, again, in TRICARE, which is formerly Champus, uh, 
with Medicare, I'm um, sorry, military hospitals and federal providers, TRICARE pays first. And again, out in the community, uh, outside of military hospitals and federal providers, Medicare will pay first. So here's my note of caution about COBRA. When an individual loses employer coverage and has Medicare eligibility, please be aware of the time frames. Um, the COBRA election period, and, and you know, for those of you who are not familiar with how COBRA works, essentially if you had been an active employee and you stopped working um, and, you, and your coverage uh, from your employer is um, no longer as an active employee, um, that's really when you start have to start thinking about Medicare if you are um, eligible for Medicare because electing COBRA, as a lot of people like to do because they're comfortable with their insurance, could get you into trouble with missing the um, enrollment period for Medicare and then being faced with a penalty, as I mentioned earlier. So it's critical to know the time frame of your COBRA election period, when your Part B enrollment period happens, and also uh, your eligibility for a Medigap open enrollment period. So these all may have de different deadlines that overlap, and um, choosing one type of coverage might cause you to lose the, your rights under other types of coverage. Um, this is another place where the state health insurance programs that I mentioned, the SHIPS, um, who have counselors who can walk you through how do you coordinate all of your different coverages. So you make sure that you make the wisest decision um, based on both your current and um, anticipated needs. And now I'll turn the program over to Judy to talk about choosing between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Thank you, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon and to help as best we can uh, people navigate this fairly complex system. As I was listening to you, Kathy, I was thinking things have become far more complex than when I first started doing this work. And, and we do want to be a resource for people living with ALS to help help you all manage to get as best as possible the coverage that meets your needs uh, through, throughout the journey uh, of life. Uh, so first, just a, a reminder, traditional Medicare is the program that has been <clears throat> in, was enacted in 1965 and has been added to over time. About 70% of people with who are eligible for Medicare are in the traditional Medicare program. I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about the pros and cons of traditional Medicare. And then Medicare Advantage is a, a system of private insurance plans which under which you can get your Medicare coverage, which as Kathy indicated, should be at least as robust as that which is available under the traditional program. Now, when you make a choice, and I'm gonna give you some um, tips as to how to do that in a bit, uh, regarding traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage, whether that's when you're first enrolling in Medicare or not, you need to uh, think carefully about what you will want and what you will need and from whom you will want the services that you need provided because your options will be different depending upon whether you're in traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. And I know we're speaking to some folks who are in Medicare right now and some who are going to become eligible for Medicare. Regardless, this really is something you need to look at every year, make sure that you're still within the system that makes sense given where you are at that time. So first, again, a little bit more about these two uh, sets of options. Traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage, and that's what MA stands for in this circumstance. Now, traditional Medicare is going to provide you with the, the widest choice of healthcare providers, and they will be nationwide. Almost all healthcare providers, physicians, hospitals, equipment suppliers, nursing home and home health agencies are certified by and participate in the Medicare program, the traditional Medicare program throughout the country. And essentially the coverage will be the same regardless of what state you live in under a traditional Medicare, uh, the traditional Medicare program. So that's the main advantage of the traditional Medicare program. 
The cost sharing, however, can be high, as Kathy indicated pre prior. Uh, there are premiums, deductibles, and copays, and they really, um, people don't realize how much they can mount up. Usually, people need to look to a, uh, purchasing a Medigap insurance plan to cover those cost sharing expenses, but there are concerns when you look to do that. Now, one is, is it possible for you to get a Medigap plan in your state? We know that there are many people living with ALS who are under age 65 and are eligible for Medicare. And there are some states that do not guarantee the right to purchase a Medigap plan if you are under 65. There are 31 states that do allow, do require you to be able to enroll in a Medicare a Medigap plan when you first become eligible for Medicare, even though you are under 65 at the time. Uh, that's another place where we'd suggest that you check in with your state SHIP, state health insurance program, to find out what Medigap plans are available to you and initially and each year when you look to see whether you uh, want to remain in a Medigap plan, a Medicare Advantage plan if you chose one and if you could get back to traditional Medicare. Also to find out what are the best values for you when you go to look for a Medigap plan. Another question is with regard to Medigap, will the Medigap policy you choose cover pre-existing conditions or are there limitations for coverage for those conditions? Now this doesn't apply to the Medicare coverage, but it could apply to the help having the cost sharing paid. Um, one of the problems with Medigap is that the premiums are often high and may be prohibitively high for some people. So you want to know whether you qualify for other help, as Kathy suggested earlier, for instance, the Medicare savings programs, which can help cover the cost sharing, the premiums, deductibles, and co-payments for lower income people. So in summary on this slide, the most important part of traditional Medicare is that the, the, the benefit provides options and access to almost all healthcare providers in the country, and you can get that coverage uh, from state to state. Another disadvantage, however, is that it's not one-stop shopping. You do have to consider whether you need and should choose a private Medicare Part D prescription drug plan because from our point of view, unfortunately, this was not set up in the traditional program. You can only get Medicare prescription drug coverage uh, through a private Part D plan. And you also, as I just said, need to see about getting a Medigap plan to help cover the out-of-pocket costs. And again, you need to make these choices uh, or make sure you're in the right choice each year. Now, what about Medicare Advantage? Medicare Advantage plans have provider networks. So parallel to the first point on the traditional Medicare uh, slide, here you see that you have the, the um, uh, limitation on the providers, the healthcare providers, the doctors, the hospitals, that you'll be able to access uh, if you're med in a Medicare Advantage plan. That's the greatest distinction between the two. And generally these networks are geographically limited and you can only get care outside the network and have it be paid for by the Medicare Advantage plan if it's for emergency or urgent care that's uh, necessary outside the geographic area. And so for example, we've represented people, uh, a person who, who uh, fell in Florida though she lived in Connecticut and uh, the Medicare Advantage plan denied the coverage entirely. We were able to show that some of that care was emergency care, and that part of the care was eventually covered by the Medicare Advantage plan. There may not always be sufficient specialists in Medicare Advantage plans, and for people with ALS, uh, this can be particularly poignant and important. So you want to make sure that the specialists you uh, might need, you do see, or you might need, or other providers are that you uh, want to use are available in the Medicare Advantage plan you're considering. And one of the things to do is to contact those providers and ask, and that will uh, help you make your choice, at least for the time being, because that can change from year to year. 
they may choose to leave. That is, providers have signed a year's contract, and every year they can determine not to stay in a particular Medicare Advantage uh, plans network. And by the same token, an MA plan can terminate, can end the contracts with the providers that they've had at any time during the year. Yet, in a, most enrollees, most people who enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan will find that they are in that plan for the remainder of the calendar year and can't make a choice again until uh, for the next calendar year. There are some special enrollment periods for people who are also eligible for Medicaid and for people with Medicare savings programs and the low income subsidy under Part D. But largely, uh, people who are not of low income will need to make a choice as if they will be in that choice for the remainder of the year. Uh, they may have to pay some or all of the cost sharing out of pocket that the MA plan uh, charges. And as Kathy indicated earlier, Medicap plans are typically not available to help cover these out-of-pocket costs for Medicare Advantage participants. So you want to make sure you know what those cost sharing responsibilities will be and if you can um, can meet them without a Medigap, without Medigap coverage. And um, note that um, sometimes those are can be lower than traditional Medicare as an extra benefit that the MA plan provides, but you want to make sure you know. Another problem with the MA plans can be that diff, uh, coordinating with other types of coverage can be more complicated than it is, and as Kathy indicated, can be complicated enough for people in traditional Medicare. Now, one thing to keep an eye on is that if you do have employer group health coverage, um, with a particular company, and that company also offers a Medicare Advantage plan. We have found that some of those private companies are automatically enrolling people in their Medicare Advantage plan when those uh, people become eligible for Medicare. You may not uh, know this until after the fact. It, it's referred to as seamless conversion, but this may not be to your benefit. So you want to make sure that uh, as you start to think about what you are, how you're going to enroll in Medicare at the get-go or what you want for the next calendar year, that you double check what kind of insurance you have at the moment. Under the law, as Kathy indicated, and this is uh, not well known, I'm afraid, and very important, Medicare Advantage plans must offer the same benefits at least equal to those that are available under traditional Medicare. They have to cover everything and under no more restrictive rules than that which is covered under Medicare, uh, the traditional Medicare program. And they can and often do offer some more coverage. Although always keep in mind that what, what they don't offer is a completely open network of healthcare providers. On the other hand, Medicare Advantage plans can and often do waive certain restrictions on coverage. Most importantly, for those who need um, care in a skilled nursing facility, most Medicare Advantage plans do not require a prior three-day hospital stay in order to get that nursing home, uh, skilled nursing facility coverage uh, under the Medicare Advantage plan. And uh, under traditional Medicare, you will require a prior three-day inpatient hospital stay. You should make the choice. Again, I, can't, I keep reiterating this um, because it's so important every year to make sure that what you're, the way you're accessing Medicare is still the best way for you. And so this, I'm speaking, these choices are about people who are first enrolling and then need to make their decision about what to do in the next calendar year, which is available to people every, every year at the end, the last quarter of the calendar year. Check your Medicare benefit plans. They can uh, benefits under the Medicare Advantage plan you've been in. They can change. Check the provider networks. By that I mean the physicians, hospitals, and other healthcare providers that will be participating in the Medicare Advantage plan, because those can change. And check the cost sharing. That is the premiums, deductibles, and out-of-pocket expenses. All of this can change annually and needs to be reviewed every year. 
Now, one of the things that we have found, and this can be particularly important for people living with ALS, is that there are a number of Medicare Advantage plans that do not have long-term care hospitals in their network. And this is something that um, you might not think to look for when you're first choosing or re-upping in a Medicare pl Advantage plan. So do check that. Also note that um, there is not hospice service coverage under the Medicare Advantage plan. However, you can, um, and this could be something you need to figure whether you can navigate, uh, elect hospice services should they become necessary through traditional Medicare. And by the same token, if you want to participate in a clinical trial, you would again need to do that through traditional Medicare, although you would not have to elect out of your MA plan for services that are not related to the uh, hospice needs or are not related to the clinical trial. Most Medicare Advantage plans are health maintenance organizations, HMOs. We've all kind of become used to that uh, acronym. This means that uh, they manage your care. They are usually uh, going to make sure that you see physicians, require that you see healthcare providers within their network, except for emergency or urgent care. There are some Medicare Advantage plans around the country which are based on a preferred provider organization model. And these will provide uh, for care outside, coverage outside the network. But those, if you see a provider outside the Medicare Advantage plans network, you will pay a premium a extra for that. Medicare Advantage plans have the discretion to charge cost sharing above traditional Medicare, although many don't. But they may not do so for chemotherapy, renal dialysis, or skilled nursing facility services. Now, having gone over the, the benefits and concerns in both traditional Medicare, of both traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage, I think you can begin to see how you might uh, make your choice of these two, broad, broadly these two options. First and foremost, you do need to choose any health insurance uh, to maximize the chance of having good, solid, valuable insurance coverage when you need it, having healthcare available to you from whom you want it, from what hospital or other facility you want to get it from, and in all the variety of care settings you might need it in. But it's a real world, so you need to consider what you can afford. And um, having done the math recently, um, I can tell you that it is true that sometimes traditional Medicare mixed with a Medigap plan and a Part D plan can be pretty pricey. So you need to see what, to, what can, can you afford. And do you qualify for assistance or access to pay for the out-of-pocket expenses we've described. So if you're of um, low to moderate in, in income, you might be able to get help from the Medicare Savings Program. You might be able to get help from a low income subsidy to help pay for prescription drug coverage on Part D. Perhaps you could get military employer, employer or other insurance, or ha I'm sorry, have that insurance, and that it would help cover uh, when um, some of the Medicare out-of-pocket costs are creating access problems. By the same token, is Medigap available to you in your state? If you change from Medicare Advantage to traditional Medicare, will you be able to get a Medigap plan? And this could be particularly important for people under age 65. Now, in addition to the expense, I would think the second, and, and depending on your financial circumstances, the second thing you absolutely want to put at the top of the, the pile of considerations, and if you can, the very top, is what doctors, healthcare providers, hospitals, and other uh, healthcare facilities you want to, you need to use and want to use. First, do they participate in Medicare at all, in traditional Medicare? Generally, I think you'll find the answer is yes, but not always. Second, what Medicare Advantage plans are they in, if any? And make sure you don't assume that because someone is participating in Medicare, that that same 
doctor participates in Medicare Advantage or in the Medicare Advantage plan that you're considering? Because the answer could be different and often is. How important is it to you continue to see or to see that healthcare provider? If it's very important, then you wanna make sure you have access, of course, through either the Medicare Advantage Network or through traditional Medicare. Is there an ALS or multiple dystrophy association clinic and a long-term care hospital in the MA network you're considering? Again, this can be very important when push comes to shove and you don't wanna to have to deal with it at the moment. Try and check into it in advance. What medications do you take? So what part D, part D again is the prescri yeah, prescription drug plan or MAPD plan, so a standalone Part D plan if you're in traditional Medicare, or a Medicare Advantage Part D plan if you're in Medicare Advantage, what are the formularies? That is this, the uh, list of, of medications that will be include, that are included because all of these Part D plans, whether you get a standalone plan because you're in traditional Medicare or a Medicare Advantage Part D plan, they all have formularies lists of medications that are covered. And you want to make sure that the ones you know, at least, that you'll need, if at all possible, are on the formularies and that the co-payments for those medications are such that you can afford. Another question when you're looking at which prescription drug benefit to uh, take is whether they cover generics or will you be required to take generics, particularly for the medication you need? And if so, will that work for you? And uh, will the options to take the brand name drug, not the generic, be something that the physician you're seeing, uh, one of the physicians will support if you cannot take the generic? Now, here are some other concerns or, or questions when you're making these decisions. Are you willing to have your care choices, healthcare choices, directed by or at least helped directed by uh, the Medicare Advantage plan by going through, um, uh, for, for example, by requiring a, that your primary care physician uh, order it, re refer you to a specialist? In traditional Medicare, that will not always be necessary. But in most Medicare Advantage plans, you would need a referral to a specialist by your primary care physician. Is that going to work for you? Do you have to get prior authorization from the Medicare Advantage plan in order to access those services? And sometimes, uh, often that's true, and sometimes that can be a barrier to getting access. Do you travel outside your general home area a lot and how, uh, how often is going to be important? If you have family that you um, uh, not only wish to visit, but that you might want to go and stay with uh, while you're um, having certain kinds of care provided or getting rehab uh, or aftercare from an, uh, a hospitalization, will you be in a Medicare Advantage plan that will allow coverage for those services outside your general home area. Traditional Medicare will allow that to happen. But if you don't have an emergency or urgent care need and you do want to get or need to get care outside your home area, you will find more limitations in a Medicare Advantage plan. How important are the extra Medicare uh, ben uh, extra benefits that Medicare Advantage plans often provide. So look to see what is in particular Medicare Advantage plans uh, uh, policy. Some of them cover some dental services like a cleaning, but make sure that in addition to the cleaning, you know whether if they find something the preventive to, uh, when doing preventive care that they would cover the, uh, what's necessary after the cleaning to determine how valuable that is to you. Some plans will provide some vision care, uh, some dollars towards a, some glasses. Uh, some will cover health club membership. As we said earlier, very often you will not have to have a prior hospital stay in order to get nursing home care. And that's something that can become very valuable at the time and not something people often think about when they go to choose a Medicare Advantage plan. 
How important is the convenience of one-stop shopping? And by that, I mean, as I've indicated earlier, if you're in traditional Medicare, you're also going to have to shop for and choose a Medigap plan, and you're also going to have to shop for and choose a Medicare Part D prescription drug plan. Uh, you need to check each year to make sure these choices work for you. And that's true whether you're in Medicare Advantage or traditional Medicare. But make sure that you can manage the enrollment process. And again, as Kathy indicated earlier, the sta each state has a SHIP, a state health insurance program, and they are invaluable in making these decisions, both initially and as you go along. So each year when you're making your choices again. What are the risks of a Medicare Advantage plan doctor possibly challenging your doctor's decision regarding what care is reasonable and necessary? We see this happen. A doc, your doctor may order a particular level of care, and then the Medicare Advantage plan may say that's not necessary and reasonable and decide not to cover it or decide it's not necessary for as much or as long as your doctor ordered the care. So this is something you really do need to take into consideration. Will you be more likely to get the care you need? Because first and foremost, that's what we want to help happen. If it's convenient, if the cover is convenient and the access to providers and suppliers is convenient, that's going to be most accessible in traditional Medicare. What about the costs? And again, in the real world, that has to be considered. And if you aren't able to get um, help paying for those out-of-pocket costs, will you get the care you need? And we, again, want to make sure that that happens. So that might be a consideration to make some compromises, if necessary, about the care, the healthcare providers uh, being limited by an MA plan in order to perhaps get lowered costs, if that's true. Is the care nearby and readily accessible? And where does your family live? Might you want to be with them for some of um, your care? And will you be able to access it in which of these two models, traditional Medicare or Medicare Advantage, you choose? So in summary, when you consider choosing between traditional Medicare and an MA plan, it's a very important decision. And it requires consideration of the need for an open network or choice of providers. And that's what you're going to get in traditional Medicare. And, you know, I have to say for people living with ALS, uh, this would really bring peace of mind to, to, for them and their families if this was possible. The need to get access to care outside one's own geographic area. This could be to be with family and friends, or it could be to go to a specialist outside your area. We know there are hospitals of excellence and there are particular specialists that you might want to see it when you're living with ALS that might not be available to you in network. On the other hand, as I said, you have to consider, of course, your individual financial circumstances. What are the out-of-pocket costs? Can you afford them? Can you afford the Medigap plan that you would ideally have to help cover the out-of-pocket costs in traditional Medicare? Are you low income enough that you could get help from some of these um, programs that we discussed? Can you afford the out-of-pocket costs or not? Place of residence, could you switch back to traditional Medicare if Medicare Advantage does not serve you well? This could differ from state to state and it could differ uh, from uh, region to region within a state. And again, this is a place where you want to get contact, contact and get help from your area SHIP, State Health Insurance Program. So they will be able to help you know more about this. Could you wait if you want to switch to the next enrollment period? So here we are in April. If you found now that the Medicare Advantage plan you're in isn't serving you well, you wouldn't be able generally in most circumstances to make a switch until uh, that would be effective until January of 2019. You want to make sure that that's going to work for you or you think it would if you choose to be in a Medicare Advantage plan. And finally, if you want to go back to traditional Medicare again, would you be able to get into a Medigap plan to help with the cost sharing? So with that, um, that's our overview. And now I'd like to um, have Matt help us with questions and comments, and we'll do all we can to address as many of them as we can. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, that is an awful lot of information. Uh, we do have a couple questions typed in and one brave person with a hand raised. Uh, so let's just go for it. Let's try to go live uh, with Connie. Connie, are you available? Connie, I think you've muted yourself. I cannot unmute you. So if you could unmute your mic. Okay, we'll have to come back to Connie. This is the risk with the live questions. Um, let's go to one of our typed in questions then. Um, David asks, and this is actually a recap because I think Judy touched on this in the in the 40s somewhere slide wise. Uh, as a person under 65, I've found that Medigap and Medicare Advantage pricing were cost prohibitive or not offered for me since providers know that I must be disabled if I'm applying prior to 65. Is this something that others have found? Um, knowledge of this could save people a lot of time researching. Yes, I, I, I'm sure Kathy will jump in. We know this to be a, a big problem and something we hope someday to solve with congressional activity. Right now, it's going to depend a lot, I think, Kathy, on where you live and uh, whether your state is recognizing this, like in Connecticut, which is where we're speaking to you from today. Um, our state has uh, required uh, plans that want to sell in Connecticut, a Medigap, must offer at least one plan to people under 65. Um, this is something that could be done with advocacy from state to state by having a licensing requirement from the state legislature. And it's something that perhaps we could work on together with advocates from Team Gleason and around the country. But the costs of Medigap are high, even when you can get into a plan. Kathy? Right. So it does vary a lot from state to state. Some states um, that are the best in this area have something called continuous enrollment, and they um, offer several plans for people who are disabled. Um, and there's a, what they call guarantee issue, which means that the, the state has to um, provide, I'm sorry, the state, the insurance companies provide um, the, the Medigap based on not an insurance rated uh, plan. So it's it's um, what they call community rated plan. So there are what we would we, we we often refer to as the Cadillac states that have Medigap plans that really are available for people. And then you kind of go down the list. Um, and the other thing that I, we can provide to you, we have a, um, a colleague at the Center for Medicare Advocacy who did um, a fabulous issue brief paper on um, uh, on it, helping people understand in what states they can get a Medigap plan um, and, and really look more into the detail of the expense of it. Um, so we'll make that available to everyone as a resource so that you can see, again, um, as we mentioned multiple times, it's so good to contact your state health insurance program. Doesn't resolve the problem. That doesn't resolve the problem, but it does tell you where you stand in terms of how, the cost of these plans. Um, in many states, if in the first six months you become eligible for Medicare, that's your window of opportunity to buy a uh, community rated plan. Um, I believe, as Judy mentioned, there are 31 states that if, if you don't hop right into a Medicare Advantage plan, but if you choose a Medicare, a, the traditional Medicare program, and you um, get into a Medigap plan in the first six months you're eligible, um, the, the cost of that plan is much, much lower than it would be if it were an insurance rated plan, again, particularly with someone who has ALS. And then they're required to sell them to you. You know, they can't for you, you can't be rated out of right. those plans. You can't those be discriminated against, against and, and there are no pre existing condition requirements in, the, in those first six months. Um, so other than that, I mean, we've done a lot of surveys and it's stunning um, in Connecticut, again, for example, because uh, this is kind of where we have most of our, um, our, our classroom activities, if you will, with Medicare. But you can get a Medigap plan for $50 a month. In Florida, that same plan will cost you $800 a month. 
Um, so the cost uh, is exorbitant in some places and it's just not right. So to the extent um, that we're doing work and, and as Judy mentioned, really trying to um, make it equal for everyone, uh, we're just not there yet. But there are certainly um, some states where this could really be something where advocacy could help to, um, to make sure that an insurance company is only able to do business in a state if they provide insurance um, that is reasonable cost and not discriminatory. Thank you both. Um, Jennifer asks, uh, you mentioned uh, the Medicare savings programs. Are people automatically screened for the QMB, SLMB, and QI programs? No, they are not, Jennifer. Um, that's an important reason to call that, to contact that um, SHIP TA center uh, address that I mentioned. Um, again, and it's very easy. If you Google the state health insurance program, you Google SHIPs and Medicare, um, they do everything they can do to, to help people. To, to find out if they qualify for these programs. I will take that back though. I think there are actually some states now, I believe Maryland has a program in which um, once you, you apply for one benefit, um, they put it through a screening process to see if you're eligible for other types of benefits, which is fabulous. Uh, but most states don't. You really have to go looking for what you qualify for. And again, every state is different. So the ones that I mentioned are the federal programs uh, but that are administered by the states, but certainly um, double check and see what's available through your own state because um, there are programs that are set up um, that are, are really helpful to people. Thanks. Um, Akia asks, if someone has TRICARE, would they also need a Part D plan? And if they don't have a Part D plan, but then need one later, would they pay a late enrollment penalty? Okay, so let's see. Let's let's take that in a couple of different steps. So if you have TRICARE, um, you will know whether or not you need a Part D plan. Um, I, I would imagine, again, that very much like the VA, there are... Um, there are, yeah, there, there are medications that are available, but again, you need to check and see what your medications are and if TRICARE will cover them. Um, and if not, then does it make sense to get a Part D plan? So it's so kind of a, a specific question. And Matt, could you repeat the second half of that question? Uh, if one does not have a Part D plan but needs one later, would they have to pay a late enrollment penalty? That's going to depend on whether the coverage under tr the tr person's TRICARE plan is considered creditable. That is at least as good as what the Part D coverage would be. And TRICARE should, uh, it should have issued a notice to that effect to someone who, if they know someone is on Medicare and is also a TRICARE enrollee. So if, if the uh, prescription drug coverage is as, is as strong as that which they would get from Medicare, which is referred to as creditable, then there would not be a penalty. Thank you both. Uh, I'm going to try again. Uh, we have another raised hand here. It looks like I can unmute this person. So Ellen, are you there? <laughs> Hi there. Um, right. My husband, Chris, was diagnosed um, in 2014. He became disabled and unable to work December of 2016, and we immediately went on COBRA um, during the five-month waiting period for Medicare. So we still have COBRA and also have Medicare. Today is the first time that I've seen that if you have a COBRA plan, Medicare should pay first, because we keep hearing from providers that the primary payer is your primary insurance or your private insurance as opposed to the Medicare. So because he's covered under a COBRA plan, even though it was a continuation of his um, workplace plan, Medicare should be paying first. Okay, so so let me just clarify with you. So he um, he's, he's obviously not working, right, because he's on – he Correct. qualified for Medicare and yes. um, in 2016, you said. He, his last day of work was December 31st, 2016. So he 
qualified in June of 2017. Okay, um, we're I'm, I'm gonna do a little bit of research while we're chatting, but I just, uh, can go back to the cover? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, so typically, did you look into, did at the time, did you, did you think to get a Medigap plan rather than elect the COBRA when you got, when you elected for Medicare? No, because we had no clue what we were doing. Okay. So, <laughs> so let me ask this, Do, does he have part B Medicare? Yes, he has he, A and B. He does have A and B. So Correct. my, yeah. my suggestion to you is that, um, you're overpaying. <laughs> um, and that's probably a general statement, but I would certainly look into that because COBRA um, typically only, you know, the maximum COBRA will be for, was for 36 months. So he's right. probably coming close to the end of his COBRA anyway. But, um, but if, if he has the coverage that he has through Medicare, um, it, he, he probably, I, I don't know if he's getting a lot more benefits based on the COBRA program, um, but that's one thing that I would check into. Does it, is there, is it mostly an overlap of coverage because he has Medicare and COBRA? And again, COBRA is the same insurance that he would have been entitled to as an employee, but now he's paying the full premium. Um, they can, right. the, the employer can charge up to 102% of what the cost yes. of the insurance is. So, um, it is ridiculous. yeah, so, but now again, you have to check on, on your state to see what his eligibility for a Medigap plan is. Uh, but okay. overall, what I would suggest is that someone really doesn't, it's, it's way too much coverage to have Medicare and a full employer plan. Uh, that you would be entitled to through COBRA. It's completely wrong if you have a provider saying that if that the private insurance will pay first, because if you have Medicare and COBRA, Medicare pays first, and then the COBRA would pay second, and, and COBRA may pay more than Medicare would pay, uh, but you may be well better off um, checking into having a Medigap plan to cover the uh, um, co-insurance, co the, the deductibles and um, co-insurance rather than hanging on to the COBRA plan. But here's what we should do. Um, if you okay. uh, can contact me directly, uh, we can talk about the details of how to look into the, the, um, the best choice for you to make. Okay, great. I'd appreciate that. And all that. Okay, and this is okay. Kathy, I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all right, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, all right, it looks like we're headed back to our written questions. There was a hand up briefly, but it seems to be gone now. Um, Juliet asks, would an ALS patient be eligible for Medicaid, especially, say, in a Medicaid expansion state like Louisiana? Uh, my brother, who is not an ALS patient, is dual eligible. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, um, it, Medicaid doesn't discriminate on diagnosis for sure. Um, so w there are a lot of folks who are duly eligible and, and being duly eligible really does open the door to a lot of other cost sharing opportunities, a lot of which are the federal program, um, Medicare savings programs that I mentioned. But there are um, also other opportunities for other coverage in, in many states through expanded Medicaid, um, some Medicaid programs for instance, have their own dental coverage. Um, so there's there are other opportunities uh, for other program um, entitlements, if you will, through Medicaid. Great, thank you. Um, Mary asks, I have recently been diagnosed with ALS. Uh, will I qualify for Medicare once I become disabled if I worked throughout my life until I had children, then took time off to raise them, and just recently in the last half year, uh, return to work. Okay, so the answer will have to be, again, the 2040 rule of Social Security, which means that you have to have worked five out of the 10 years before your disability began. Um, and when I say the disability, that's not the diagnosis of ALS, it's when you uh, were no longer engaged in substantial gainful activity. 
So that's what they, that's how they determine the onset. So uh, this is heartbreaking, right? Because one of the, the concerns that we have about folks who are in that position, who have paid on, paid into the social security system earlier on in their lives and will be entitled to retirement benefits uh, when they reach retirement age of 62. Uh, if they have not recently paid into the social security system, they haven't paid what, what some consider to be called the premiums to be insured for social security disability benefits. Um, and that's the requirement of the insurance is that the premiums are that you paid into the system at least five out of the 10 years before you stopped um, substantial gainful activity and your disability began. So um, it kind of sounds like that's not the case. But, um, you know, the, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the only other uh, possibilities are if if you um, somehow had paid into Medicare without paying into Social Security, or if you're um, um, a disabled widow or widower. Otherwise, unfortunately, we haven't been able to find a way to make that happen. I know that there's um, some um, uh, bills in Congress right now that address this issue and essentially say you will be covered um, it, it's, it will be creditable if you stayed home with your children or you had another um, job within the house that you didn't pay into Social Security. Um, that type of coverage would expand it, but that hasn't passed yet. Thank another you very thing, much. Yeah, sorry, and I was just going to say it's another thing to advocate for. And speaking of things to advocate for, uh, Jean heard something uh, and wonders if it's true, uh, and if so, if ad advocacy could be done for other conditions. She heard that end-stage renal disease can, qual uh, sorry, that individuals with end-stage renal disease can qualify for Medicare based on a spouse's work credits, and would like to know if that is true. And if yes, is that true for other conditions, or could there be work done to make it so? Well there could be work done, but I'm afraid that current, you know, um, people with ALS, for example, don't have to wait as long to get Medicare as people with other conditions. And that's as a result of very good advocacy that was done on behalf of the ALS community. And there are qualifications that were done on behalf of the SRD community over the years. I, I have to say that unless things change, this is Judy, significantly, I would not hold out a lot of hope in the near future for such extensions of coverage. Yeah, yeah. Do and have other I'm not aware that there is such a provision for anyone. Um, I will say the thing that I know about ESRD is that ESRD, when people talk about is Medicare available for children, um, no, the answer is no, um, but for people with end-stage renal disease, um, children with end-stage renal disease, can get benefits off of their parents' records. Um, so, th so, th so that's a carve out that I'm aware of, but I am, I've never heard of, um, uh, of anyone being able to get Medicare for any other reason off of someone else's uh, work record. Thank you very much. Um, Charles asks a question on supplement plans. Do you have any thoughts on the C and F supplement plans not being available after 2020? Should one choose to change to a D or G plan now, for example? I, I don't think that would be the best approach. We are concerned about, again, there's a lot of, I think, overzealous interest in trying to, in these ways, save dollars and um, a notion that people with full full insurance coverage use more health care than they need. I think both of those things are misguided. This is Judy. I do think that, and I'll see what Kathy says, but while the good plans that meet your needs are available, that you should be in them if you can. And if anything, there may be more ability. We'll see how it plays out uh, as time goes by to stay in those plans if you're already in them than if you made the switch sooner. Kathy, did you have to? Yeah, actually, I, uh, we have an advocate that works in our office that's um, fabulously, um, um, I don't say aggressive, that's not the right term, but um, she recently found out that 
the F plan will be available to people who are currently in there. So you're grandfathered in. If you're in an F plan, stay in an F plan. That's the Cadillac of all of the um, cost sharing, um, paying for deductibles and coinsurance that Medicare offers. Uh, I'm sorry, that the Medigap plans offer. Um, so definitely stay in an F plan if you can. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about in terms of the of the letters, um, an F plan is the same no matter where you buy a Medigap plan or who you buy it from. Um, I often say, you know, we, we, we look at some of the um, plans like Colonial Pen, um, who uses Alex Trebek as their spokesperson, has a hugely, and, and excuse me if anyone knows Alex Trebek, but it's got a hugely high premium on it. And, and there are other um, insurance companies that offer the exact same uh, cost sharing, the exact same deductible and uh, co-insurance coverage as a Medigap plan that have a much, much lower premium. Um, so go with the company um, that charges the lowest premium on a Medigap plan because uh, you don't want to pay for Alex Trebek's salary for doing commercials for Colonial Pen. Um, but that's just something to look at. But stay in the F plan. Um, they have two, there are two F plans. One is a high deductible F plan, uh, which again, I can tell you in Connecticut is like $50 a month. Um, it, it does have like the, you have to pay the first, um, I think it's $2,000 out of pocket and then everything gets paid after that. Or you can go with a regular F plan, which has a higher premium um, with no, high deductible on it. Uh, the, the cost sharing, the payments for deductibles and coinsurance start right away. Um, and and you just have to weigh and balance kind of what the out-of-pocket for the premium would be versus when you would start getting that coverage to happen. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that I will say it depends, uh, but the Medigap F plans is not one of them. So stay in the F plan. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, Diana asks, uh, this is a question I don't think we've gotten before. Uh, first quarter of the year is when eligibility is effective. How does that work with employers like a private school who offer enrollment in August and September? Uh, my husband has ALS and is under my insurance at school. So are we talking about the, the uh, I'm sorry, the secondary insurance through the school? I'm not certain. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm just not sure. I want to make sure I understand the question. So um, Medicare can start anytime a person needs it. What we're taught, when we say that it becomes effective in January, that just means that, that um, on an ongoing basis, a person can't typically change their um, elections for Medicare, whether they're gonna be in traditional Medicare or a Medicare Advantage plan. They can't change their elections um, to be effective other than the, fun the next January. So, so let me just give you an example. Um, the annual coordinated election period for Medicare is from October 15th through December 7th. It stops on December 7th, because they want to make sure that all the carriers have enough time between December 7th and the 31st to get everybody ready to have the changes effective on January 1st. So um, uh, Medigap plans and Part D plans kind of have this rolling, you can change them kind of when you need to, or when you want to. Uh, it's, the, it's the big coverage uh, choices between a Medicare Advantage plan and original Medicare that are typically happen. Um, but uh, but I'm, I don't know if I'm rambling or I'm just trying to answer the question. But the if the original question was when can you get into Medicare, you can get into Medicare um, as soon as you um, become eligible. And again, for, for people with ALS, that's typically the, um, the day the first of the month that your social security benefits, uh, your your cash benefits uh, are payable. I think that's great, thank you. Um, let's go, we have uh, time for one more question, I think. Uh, and I have a perfect question to transition us to next week's webinar. Um, Lynn says, here's the scenario. 
person living with ALS is on my company plan as primary, Medicare Part A secondary. Is there any help for home health care? And is it state specific? We happen to be in Florida. So uh, yes, it's a great segue to join us next next Wednesday at this same time um, from 3 to 4.30 when we will be focusing on the Medicare home health benefit. Under law, it's very ro it's quite robust. If you need, if you're, if you're homebound, as you'll hear, that doesn't mean you can never leave home or certainly not that you're bed bound and you need a skilled nursing or physical or speech language pathology services, then Medicare often will be available to cover that. And under the law, it will also cover a fair amount of home health aid services, medical social services, and some supplies. It doesn't vary under law from state to state. And as you will hear next year, uh, next week, uh, what the Medicare benefit uh, should be and what we know is happening in practice may vary, but it, it, there is a lot of home health coverage potentially available for people with ALS. And we'll talk about that in detail next Wednesday from 3 to 4.30. Yeah, as, as you can tell, Judy gets very excited <laughs> when she uh, starts to talk about home health care and what people should be getting. I, I think if I could jump in and just add um, to Lynn's question about having a company plan that pays first. Anytime you, you have um, a coordination of coverage um, circumstance, I think it's always, you, you know, you always hope that you can expand whatever you can get, um, having, you know, melding both of those programs together. Of course, we don't know what the, um, what, what Lynn's company plan would cover, um, but, it's important to, to, again, check out from, from every source that you can. We can certainly help you understand what, what he should be um, getting under Medicare, but under the company plan, there could be more benefits um, that will better coordinate to provide even expanded care. So I would, would jump on talking to the um, human resources person with the company to see um, what opportunities there are to to get as much care as possible. Thank you both very much. Um, we are right up against our time limit now. Um, I know we might have a couple questions in the pipeline. Uh, we will absolutely answer those and get the answers out to today's attendees. Um, I want to thank everyone who did attend today. A thank you to Judy and Kathy as well for a great presentation and of course our great thanks to Team Gleason for partnering with us on this important initiative. Uh, as we have just uh, hinted at heavily, please do join us next week for the second in our series, an overview of Medicare home health coverage. Uh, we'll discuss related law, regulations, policies, and practical tips to assist people living with ALS to access home and community-based Medicare coverage. That's next Wednesday, April 18th, 3 p.m. Uh, one last reminder about those questions. If we didn't get to yours, or if you have further comments or questions once we're offline, uh, or if I couldn't unmute you and you never got a chance to ask your question, please feel free to email us at that home health at medicareadvocacy.org email address. Thank you all once again, and I will now conclude today's webinar.